Hey, what's up, you CISSP wannabes? I am Colin Weaver. You're watching the IT Dojo CISSP Questions of the Day, where each and every time I come at you, I'm going to bring you two questions to help you as you continue to prep for that CISSP exam. So, today's questions are brought to you by the color purple. So let's go ahead and jump into it. All right, question number one. You have company-issued laptops with integrated wireless LAN adapters that are going to be used outside of the office, and they're going to be connecting to networks that you are assuming are not trusted. My question for you is, given the choices that I'm about to show you, which of them represents the best way for you to go in and secure those users' transmitted data? Give those options a look over, click pause, think about it. When you're ready, click play, and we can walk it through. All right, let's look at answer choice number one. Let's go ahead and do some full disk encryption. Full disk encryption is a great idea, but it doesn't do anything to help protect transmitted data. It only protects the data that's on the system. So that is not the correct answer choice. Although it's a good thing to do, it's not the right thing to do in this particular question. Ooh, I know. How about you configure the systems to use protected EAP when they are connected to an untrusted wireless LAN? That's an awesome idea, except you know what? Clients don't control how the authentication and connection is going to be established. It's the uh, access point that controls it. So if the access point is not configured to do protected EAP, you can want to do protected EAP all day long, but you're still not going to be able to do it. So both the supplicant and the authenticator have to be set up in order to do protected EAP. And quite honestly, that's just not going to happen when you're out and about. When you're rolling up on a Starbucks or trying to get some free Wi-Fi at the mall or something like that, those people don't do protected EAP because the complexities of handling trusted certificates and authenticated user credentials and all those other things is too much. So you're really only ever going to see protected EAP or EAP TLS in enterprise deployment scenarios. When you're talking about all this free Wi-Fi world that we live in where people are just kind of out and about connecting at their buddy's house or, or at the coffee shop, um, you're pretty much going to be left with WPAPSK uh, as your only answer choice. And uh, even though it's not ideal, it's kind of all we got right now. All right, let's look at answer choice number three. It says that you're going to require users to establish a VPN connection when they're uh, connected to an untrusted network. This is totally what you would do. In fact, this is a great idea just for general life. So whether you're talking about doing this from your enterprise perspective or you're talking about doing it from a personal perspective, this is just good, solid uh, security practice for you to go in and do. You come to my office, you connect to my network. What should your trust in me be? About that much. You go to a coffee shop. What should your trust in that network be? Same amount. When you go to your buddy's house, what should your trust in that network be? Same amount. Don't trust anybody. Not when it comes to network security. So if I go to any of those people's networks, or if I go to your house and connect to your network, right after I connect to your network, I'm also going to establish a VPN connection. Now, the benefit of that is that, sure, my data may be encrypted as it's traveling, you know, uh, across the wireless portion from my computer to your laptop, or excuse me, to your access point, uh, but that's encryption that's provided by the access point. I don't really care about that and from my security perspective because once the data gets to the other side, it's in plain text. And uh, now, yes, it could be encrypted data. It could be like HTTPS or something inside that, but it is technically in plain text in that it's no longer afforded any protections that are created by the wireless LAN itself. So by establishing a VPN and then tunneling all my traffic to a VPN server on the internet and then having that internet traffic go out to the internet through that, it guarantees that nobody's going to be able to abuse their privilege on uh, the, the local network that you're connected to, whether it's on the wireless component of it where somebody might be trying to eavesdrop on your traffic, or if it's on the distribution system side, which very commonly is a wired network, not always, but very commonly, where somebody might be trying to go in and, and look at your data and manipulate your data that way. By having a VPN connection, you get end-to-end -end encryption from your laptop or your phone all the way to your VPN server, which is out on the internet, and then the data goes swimming out onto the internet from there. And then it comes back through that tunnel, and anybody who is at the coffee shop or at your friend's house or at my office who's trying to snip, snoop on your data can't. So absolutely, that's the solution that you should be looking to go in and do. All right, that leaves us with our last choice, which says to configure the clients to use AES when they are connecting to a wireless LAN. And again, that's not something that the clients control. It's the access point, the network to which you're connecting that controls what the encryption algorithm is going to be. So not going to happen. 
Hey, I told you last time that IT Dojo does more than just the ICP questions of the day. We also do things like VMware training. Uh, we can do CASP, CYSA, any of the other um, ISC squared specialties, any of that stuff. Reach out to us if you need to get enrolled in something like that. We can hook you up. Question number two today is, a public facing web server has been infected with a kernel level rootkit. My question for you is, given the choices that I'm gonna show you, which of them is the best recommendation on how you should handle the issue? There's your answer choices. Click pause, read them through, click play, and we'll talk it through. Choice number one says that the best way to handle this is for you to uninstall the rootkit and then recover any corrupted data from your backups. While that sounds like not totally horrible as an answer, I would absolutely not recommend doing that. If you've been infected with a kernel level rootkit, simply uninstalling the rootkit doesn't necessarily provide you with the assurances that you have actually gotten it. Okay, rootkits, particularly kernel level rootkits by design hide themselves. And so what level of assurance do you have that you've actually removed this thing? Two, the other thing that you really don't know is, okay, yeah, you got rootkitted, but what happened after you got rootkitted? There's a high degree of likelihood that other things may have been installed or critical components may have been replaced. And so your faith and confidence in this system should be rapidly hovering and dwindling right around zero. Choice number two says that you should remove the system from the network and manually remove the rootkit files. <sighs> Again, could sound compelling, but not really the most recommended way for you to go in and do this. Uh, removing the system from the network, certainly a worthy consideration because you want to stop the bleeding. You want, if there's data loss that's occurring right now because of this rootkit being on the system, then we want to stop that process from continuing on. But manually removing the rootkit files, again, eh, I'm so sure that you're going to have the warm and fuzzy feelings. Like when you leave work at the end of the day, having removed that rootkit manually, are you really going to be driving home feeling all warm and fuzzy, high-fiving yourself, patting yourself on the back, going, yeah, man, crush that rootkit? Uh, probably not. You're probably going to be going, huh, could still be infected. How about choice number three then? How about you reinstall the operating system from a trusted source and then recover your data from backup? Yes. That is widely regarded as the most appropriate course of action. Now, I am not gonna say always 100% of the time because there's always gonna be exceptions. And that's one of the things that you find in, the, in the, this realm of security is that every situation can be sort of a case-by-case -case decision in that we might choose to take a different action in one scenario versus another. But generally speaking, if you discover that your system has been infected with a kernel level rootkit, your confidence in that system is no longer. So you're going to want to reinstall from a trusted source, and then you're going to want to recover the data on that system from a trusted backup. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't recover yourself right back to being rootkitted. So you would want to take some steps to make sure that that's true, but uh, definitely slicking the rig and starting over is sort of the, the angle that you're going to most commonly take. That leaves the last answer choice, which is also not a terrible answer choice. It's just not the best answer choice. The preceding answer choice was the best one. Um, and this one says for you to install a rootkit removal tool and use it to remove the, remove the uh, rootkit from the system. Uh, there are rootkit removal tools out there. Some of them are not bad. And uh, again, do you really have the warm and fuzzy feeling that all of the outgrowths from this compromise have been remedied? And the short answer is, is that you really can't. Has somebody gone in and you know, replaced LS? You know, has somebody gone in and replaced some other critical component that um, is not really part of the rootkit, but they've been able to go in and, and modify the system in such a way that if you were to run some other stuff or that there's some other code that's been embedded. You know, entrenchment's a big deal for these guys when they get into your system. So even though it's not a horrible answer, it's definitely not the best answer. Uh, the one that comes before is really the one you should have chosen. All right, I thank you for watching. The Color Purple thanks you for watching. Hope you guys have a great day and I will see you next time.